Hello. Um, well, it's a pleasure to be here for this uh, school. I think it's really wonderful to be at an event where you bring together the high energy people and condensed matter people. I've had a long time interest in taking things from quantum field theory and using them in condensed matter. And so this has kind of really exploded now in this field of topological phases. And so, uh, so this is a fantastic uh, uh, school that we're in. All right, so I'm going to talk about mostly about fractional quantum Hall effect. Um, here's an overview. Um, so I'm going to start with some of the sort of uh, uh, mandatory remarks about how about phases of matter and, and symmetry and so on, and then about um, uh, um, and symmetry breaking, and then about topological phases. And that, so then I'll make some uh, general statements about topological phases without trying to break them down into classes uh, as far as Xiao Gang did. Um, and I'll talk about the basic ideas, ground state degeneracy and quasi-particles, which I'll be especially interested in in this lecture. Fusion, fusion rules, statistics, um, that's all in principle general, at least in two plus one dimensions. Then I'll say something about fractional quantum Hall effect as a phenomenon and the background uh, in, the, in the field, theoretically. And then I will come to uh, conformal field theory constructions, um, uh, stuff I developed with Greg Moore, new constructions of states. Then I'm going to talk about um, calculating statistics of the quasi-particles in these things. And finally, I have a, a slide or two about topological quantum computation. I don't know if anyone has really talked about that here, but we should at least make a few brief remarks about how these things are connected, because that's one of the real points of interest in this subject at the moment. So there's obviously rather a lot of stuff here, and I'm not sure how long it's going to take me to cover this. And if I don't get to the end, I'm not going to speed up. I'm just going to hold things over for my next lecture. OK? All right. Um, well, I could speed up, perhaps, is in the very introductory part, which perhaps you've already heard several times. So, um, so the question is, what is, an, what is an equilibrium phase of matter? What does that mean? So if we've got some matter, some large collection of particles, and maybe you'll be interested in something homogeneous, and we want to imagine a thermodynamic limit in which the size of our system and the number of particles goes to infinity, but the density of particles stays fixed as we take the limit, that's a kind of thermodynamic state of matter. Well, we want to characterize the state of this matter, and we would rather like to be able to do it independent of the microscopic details of the Hamiltonian of our system, because after all, we don't necessarily know the microscopic details in practice, so we would like to have something a bit better than that. Um, maybe even independent of thermodynamic parameters, maybe even independent of the precise constituents of the matter that we're looking at, so that we can say, well, we get the same phase of matter in this system as in this other very different, uh, apparently different system. So we need to be able to decide when some phases count as the same or whether states uh, count as being in the same phase, alternatively, when do they count as the same, when do they differ? When do they differ? And the difference between different phases should be something sharp. So this means that phases are um, somehow a description of the state with not all of the details included, but what phase something is in should remain invariant under, as we change any uh, parameters that we have in our Hamiltonian, and there could in principle be maybe infinitely many parameters that may have to be considered. So under changes in the parameters in the Hamiltonian, uh, it, generally it remains in the same phase, but at some point some boundary may be crossed and a distinct phase is entered. All right. So an example of uh, uh, distinct phases is the liquid versus the gas in a, in a fluid or a system of particles. And at first we may think that this is, these are different phases as we hear in high school perhaps after all, there's boiling and so on. But actually, in this case, they can be continuously connected in the tem temperature pressure diagram without passing through a thermodynamic transition. OK. So a historically important uh, paradigm is the, the, the idea of symmetry, using use of symmetries. So we suppose we have a symmetry of the Hamiltonian. 
Um, at this point, I should stop and say that I'm going to assume uh, what, what, what does my system look like more generally. And I'm really going to be thinking about quantum systems, not the classical things like the liquid gas transition. So my basic assumptions are that I have some, uh, my system is built up out of microscopic degrees of freedom that are local in space, just like Xiao Gang was talking about, maybe quantum spins. Uh, that means I have a tensor product of small, <laughs> small spaces, tensor product over lattice sites, or maybe particle systems. And my Hamiltonian is always short range in space, real space, someone was asking this morning. Um, so the Hamiltonian can only involve short range hopping interactions, short range interactions and so on. So the Hamiltonian may have some, may possess some symmetry. I think what I say here is still correct, even if, I, if the symmetries are the generalized symmetries that Nati Seiberg was talking about. And so there may be regions in parameter space in which the symmetry is spontaneously broken in the thermodynamic limit, um, as opposed to not broken in some other region or as opposed to being broken in a different way. And so the theorem, which is, which is really a theorem here, is that these, these are things which cannot be continuously connected without passing through a boundary. So if you change parameters, the symmetry is either broken or not broken, you can't go smoothly from one to the other, there's a sharp boundary at which this changes. This is a sharp distinction between phases. Yeah? By sharp uh, let's say we, ex let's, we, we exclude that. So usually I would like to say falls exponentially. That would be very convenient. But often you can get away with something weaker like some power law if it's, doesn't, if it's not, too, uh, not too slow. Okay? And, and usually that will, not, that will be okay as well, in fact. Um, okay, so this uh, theorem is only in quotes because it's not very precisely stated. It really is a theorem. And so here an example is the liquid solid transition um, because this breaks translation and rotation symmetry and the symmetry is, well, so the symmetry is, exists in the liquid but it's broken in the solid. And there can be different solid phases in which the symmetry is broken in different ways. An example is um, H2O where there are many different crystalline phases of ice. Okay, so that's, that's fine. Now, there, there is probably still a widespread belief that the converse theorem is also a theorem, or that the converse is also a theorem. So that's, that one has a question mark. So that converse would say that if <laughs> phases cannot be connected without crossing a boundary, there must be a broken symmetry. There must be a difference in symmetry. Um, quite a lot of people may still believe that. But it's now understood that this, uh, this, this part of the symmetry paradigm is, is just wrong. Okay. So, in fact, that's not just a statement that it appeared in the last few years. Um, cracks in this idea were already showing up in maybe the 70s and 80s, in condensed matter physics in particular. There's also, you could also provide examples from... Uh, from field theory, such as gauge theory, has also challenged this paradigm. But uh, the condensed matter, matter ones, things like the costlitz thalus transition, um, the low temperature phase of the XY model is a distinct phase, but there's no symmetry breaking in a, a strict sense. That doesn't challenge us too much because we can still use very similar <laughs> concepts in field theory to analyze this. Uh, but then there are other things in condensed matter, such as uh, spin glasses and metal insulator transition, which, um, um, at least under some conditions, um, the key questions and the different phases don't or, or may not uh, be distinguished by, by symmetry properties. So these were already some indications that this is not really correct. But the real challenge came from the integer and fractional quantum Hall effect. And uh, this was, so this starts about 1980. And, um, and this has sort of expanded into this whole field of topological phases of matter and um, topological insulators and superconductors. So these are quantum phases of matter. So now we're, we're talking about <laughs> phases occurring at zero temperature dominated by quantum mechanics. Um, there may not be any phase transition at non-zero temperature, but there are transitions at zero temperature. And in these phases, there is no uh, difference in symmetry distinguishing the phases. All right. 
Uh, and so in response to this, theorists, uh, theorists develop the concept of topological phases of matter. So here's how I'm going to define it. A topological phase is a quantum system um, in a topological phase if there's an energy gap above the ground state uh, for bulk excitations in the thermodynamic limit. Uh, this is, Xiaogang really said this this morning. So I'll just refer to this energy gap in the energy spectrum as a gap. So the gap stays finite in the thermodynamic limit. And again, the, the, the point is there could be gapless excitations on an edge, but that goes off to infinity, and so we're talking about the bulk gap. Uh, now the folklore, which uh, perhaps is proved by now, I'm not quite sure, the folklore is that uh, an energy gap cannot close under a small perturbation of the Hamiltonian by or by sufficiently small perturbation, if the terms I add are local terms. If, they, if I add a term, maybe an integral of some local operator. Um, okay, I mean, this is actually something that's perfectly straightforward to really prove if you have a finite dimensional matrix Hamiltonian, the difficulty comes when you're dealing with an infinite number of degrees of freedom and you need some different math. Um, okay. And so therefore, these will be viewed as being in the same phase as long as the, um, under the small perturbation, being in the same topological phase, but when a, a transition occurs, the gap collapses. Now one thing about this definition is that it sounds too trivial. I haven't said anything topological really so far. And in fact, this definition allows a trivial insulator phase to be called topological. Um, well, that's sort of the price you pay for using this definition. Um, you can think of that as the zero in the various classification schemes. At least there's only one of these really trivial topological phases in each dimension of space-time. Um, and so then, in order to talk about non-trivial topological phases, we're going to use, need a little bit more. So in order to distinguish phases, we're going to talk about topological properties. So these are properties well, very vaguely, what we want to use in any description of a phase is we want to say that there are certain things that are the same throughout the phase, some properties that are not changed by small perturbations staying within the phase. Very much, very much like actually uh, universal properties of phase transitions of critical points. So in topological phases, we may think of these as topological invariant properties um, uh, meaning that they don't change under perturbations of the Hamiltonian. So an example of this is, well, one is the existence of the bulk energy gap itself, although the size of the gap may change, the gap is still there <coughs> within the phase just by definition. That's why that's number zero in this list. The other ones that are not part of the definition are things like multiplicity bigger than one of ground states for the system placed on a surface or, or space of non-trivial Topology, that means not the sphere, but the torus or some other topology. Um, another topological property is the existence of quasi-particles with non-trivial statistics. That can't change under small perturbations. Uh, robust gapless edge excitations, quantized transport properties. Many things that we've heard about, or you've heard about it in this school. So in principle, it's, at least to my knowledge, all non-trivial topological phases possess at least one or more of these last four uh, kinds of properties. So they can be used to distinguish topological phases from each other. <coughs> and there's one more thing I want to mention, which is that all non-trivial phases uh, possess some non-trivial and topologically invariant entanglement behavior, and this seems to be the most general way of capturing what's non-trivial in a topological phase. But it seems to happen in uh, every case. All right. So the most natural way to understand topological properties is by formulating an effective field theory description. Um, in fact, you could say that's a fixed point of the renormalization group. So this is some low energy, long wavelength description of the response of the ground state to external probes, for example, and also a description of the quasi-particle properties. Um, so the bulk 
part of this effective field theory would consist of local terms because of the underlying short-range interactions. And topological invariance of things holds because of the mass gap in the energy spectrum and the short-range <coughs> nature of the Hamiltonian. Um, and so in these lectures, I'm going to describe methods for constructing some non-trivial topological phases and for finding the effective field theory, or at least um, its phenomenological uh, properties in, in certain cases, especially ones in which, you which are not free fermions and in which you can't use perturbation theory. And do feel free to interrupt with uh, questions as I go along. You've already had one. Yes. That's correct. That's why that's number zero in the examples. So that one, yes. Right, that's right. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah. Okay. Um, okay. Um, well, if it has gapless Goldstone modes, it doesn't fit my definition of topological. Now, so the fact is that really we ought to be formulating notions in which we in can include, can allow for symmetry breaking properties as well as <laughs> topological properties. For simplicity, I'm not discussing that type of thing here. If we, want, if we actually want to allow for gapless Goldstone modes, we would obviously have to modify definitions. If we want to allow for phases which are gapless but still in some sense topological, we may need a different definition of what we actually mean. And uh, I think that lies in the future. Um, it's not very well characterized yet, but um, uh, I mean, it's possible we want to change definitions or introduce new terminology for those things. But uh, by adopting this definition that I'm using here for topological phase and, and saying that nothing is, no, no symmetry is being broken or just ignoring symmetries, um, this, uh, this gives us something well-defined that we can actually work on. So that's what I'm, that's the philosophy. All right, so here are some basic notions. So this part really comes from when and new. Um, so we'll talk about uh, um, degenerate ground states on when it's on some surface or on some, uh, <coughs> under some boundary conditions. Degenerate meaning the same energy. So if these are topologically degenerate, what it Im implies is that uh, if I take any local operator, and so by a local operator, I mean an operator that acts, uh, that affects the degrees of freedom inside some bounded region of some size and acts as the identity on everything outside. We can write that formally. That takes a little notation. I'm not going to do it. I hope it's clear what is meant by that. Um, and so if we take any local operator between two of these uh, states in this degenerate space, the matrix elements of these, well, for the whole set of them, in fact, are proportional to the Kronecker delta, to the identity matrix. So what that means is that it's the diagonal elements are, can be non-zero, but they're always the same, independent of alpha, and the off-diagonal elements are zero. And this implies that if I try to add a term, if I, or if I do add a term like the integral of O to my Hamiltonian, um, since this is local, I'm allowed to add this to the Hamiltonian. Um, this cannot split the energies of these states. Okay. And so, uh, so what I'm doing here is I'm saying that um, if, if the states in question in this set did not have this property, then I can add such a term. So let's imagine I've already added any such terms that are possible and I've split any other degeneracies. So I can assume that whatever's left, whatever degeneracy is left, therefore, is topological, if you like, and has this property, okay? So this is the generic thing. There could be other degeneracies that occur, perhaps accidentally at some, for some sets of parameters, but um, they don't occur generically because they can be split in this way. So what this means is that degen these topologically degenerate ground states are indistinguishable from one another by any local probe that we might apply. Um, and I should say here that uh, when I'm making these statements about 
local probes and so on, the degeneracy is not split. Um, all of these things really mean that I'm, uh, I'm saying, for example, here that splittings would be exponentially small in the system size that, I'm, that I have in mind, really, that I'm taking some, some limits, um, that sometimes I want to say things are well separated. I mean that um, they're asymptotically far separated. I have to take the system size to infinity before I take the separations large, and so on. Um, and um, <coughs> and so, uh, so these statements about what you can and can't do with local operators should be understood as meaning that you have to describe it in terms of some orders of limits and with exponentially small corrections, which decay exponentially with some length scale over some correlation length, which is intrinsic to my, to my system and related to the mass gap. Now, one other thing about the term local, apart from not only does it act only within some bounded distance of some point x, um, local operators are supposed to commute at well-separated positions. So that means they're, they're in the strict sense that I'm using here, fermion operators are not local. Okay? Now, sometimes you may want to relax that and, and say they're local and we use the, treat them as local quantum fields and so on. Um, well, we can have a discussion about when we want to do that. One reason that we do do that is that we already have fermions given to us in nature. So we're quite used to fermions and perhaps we neglect that in some sense, these are already remarkable topological kinds <laughs> of uh, objects. Okay. So now let's come to quasiparticle excitations. This is more my point of view about these things. I'm going to assume that space is two-dimensional, so we're in two plus one dimensions now. So let's imagine that we, we have a ground state so what we may be able to do with this ground state is we may be able to, if you like, twist it around a point, something like putting a vortex into it um, to make a defect. <coughs> so this is a state of our whole system. It lives in the same Hilbert space. I'm not changing the Hamiltonian of my system. So this is an intrinsic defect. And what we get is some excited state, uh, not necessarily an energy eigenstate. And so because, uh, and we'll see examples of this later, so because in some sense all we're doing is sort of twisting maybe by a gauge, something, something which locally looks like a gauge transformation, because we're just twisting the ground state far away from this point, again up, that means further than some correlation length, the state still looks just like the ground state. So the matrix elements of local operators like I was just discussing are the same far away from this object as they were in the ground state. And so this is sort of a point-like thing. It's constructed in, with reference to a point. So I'm justified in calling it a, a quasi-particle. It's sort of point-like. Um, okay. Uh, so, yeah. all right. So close to the position where I do this, it's, it may not look like the ground state. I've really done something. I've made a vortex core or something. And this means that the, the fact that there is a quasi-particle there can be determined by a local measurement near the position. And furthermore, with local operators, I can move, I can shift the quasi-particles around. And so that means I can put such terms in the Hamiltonian, or an effective Hamiltonian, so these can have kinetic energy, they can hop around from place to place. Um, also, in, uh, one would expect that the fact that this is basically the ground state away from this point means that the excitation energy of the object, of the quasi-particle, will be finite, not infinite. So the interesting case, as in this description of a twist, is in these point-like objects that cannot be created or destroyed by a local operator. To make this kind of twist, which means twisting something in the state all the way out to some large distance, at least as far as maybe the next quasi-particle, if not out to infinity, I'll, I'll view it as a large <laughs> distance, means that these cannot be created or destroyed by a local operator. Again, if you put things in finite size, you sort of lose the distinction between what's local and what's, what's not, but you can give some more precise meaning to this, to this statement. So this means that um, whatever these objects are, it's not possible for, them to, for one of them to just suddenly appear in isolation during the time evolution of the system. If they are going to be created at all, 
or destroyed, you have to do it along with some other antiparticle object so that they can annihilate to form the ground state. So there could be many of these quasi-particle excitations, uh, but I want to identify some of them in equivalence classes, so I want to <laughs> identify them as being the same type if uh, two of, so I want to identify two of them as being the same type if, they, if one can be obtained from the other by acting with a local operator. Okay, so we're sort of modding out by action of local operators and we're interested in the things that cannot be created and destroyed by local operators. Okay, also they're the same type. If I can move it from here to another place, then it's the same type of quasi-particle. So usually the number of types of quasi-particles is finite since it may be an open question whether it's even possible to have a topological phase with an infinite number of quasi-particle types. Uh, and there's one sort of honorary quasi-particle type which is the operation where I do nothing to the ground state. Or in the equivalence class which <laughs> makes it the same type, I could also act just with a local operator on the ground state and then I have some excitation that I say is of the, uh, the trivial type or the identity type. Okay. Um, okay, this I've already said this point. Um, okay, so then what happens if I consider two quasiparticles, alpha and beta, and I sort of bring them into some region and then view this from a large, a great distance, then I kind of only can see one single object, so I must get some other possibly different quasiparticle type, say gamma. So this is fusion of two quasi-particle types to, to a third type, which may or may not be the same as uh, alpha or beta. I'll have some more to say about that in a minute. Now, something that's um, very crucial for what we want to talk about <coughs> is that when I have a state containing several quasi-particles, these states may be with quasi-particles at some definite positions, which I want to be very well separated. These states may be degenerate. They may have, there may be more than one state with the same energy. And this, is, uh, this degeneracy is again topological, like for the ground states, it can't be split by um, adding a local operator th to the Hamiltonian. Nor can you, so you can't distinguish one of the states from, from another, nor can you cause a transition from one to another with a local operator. Okay, and uh, so when this happens, the multiplicity or the dimension of the subspace is independent of the positions of these quasi-particles as long as they're well separated. And, um, and the fact that you can't flip it or discern which state you're in with a local operator means that this is going to be rather useful for non-local storage of information. Because, um, uh, um, <coughs> because the decoherence processes that can ruin our storing of quantum information have to be modeled by local terms in the Hamiltonian like everything else. And so in this case, they cannot flip the, or degrade the state of the, uh, in the degenerate subspace. So that's why this is of interest for quantum information processing. All right, so let me come back to fusion for a minute. Uh, so the fusion can be described by the fusion rules so let's um, uh, describe this in a slightly formal way, which is useful. So imagine that phi alpha is some element, some algebraic element corresponding to type alpha. Then I can write a formal multiplication. But when I fuse alpha and beta, I get maybe more than one possibility <laughs> for gamma. And so I'll write this formally as a sum, n ga alpha beta gamma times phi gamma, and n alpha beta gamma is symmetric in alpha and beta, and these are non-negative integers. Uh, sorry, alpha represents the equivalence class right. of phi alpha? For that class? Well, phi alpha corresponds to a type alpha. Alpha is an equivalence class. Phi alpha is just, basically just a symbol. Is it a representative of alpha? No, it's a symbol, indexed by alpha. Okay, this is a very formal, Thing, all right? This is just this is just rules, and the important thing in the rules is the set of numbers n. It's not a field operator or anything else. Okay, it's just labeled by a by an index alpha. Yes. From your description, though, it sounds like n alpha beta gamma could be a vector space. This dimension is not an alpha beta gamma, because you said there was a space of degenerate states. 
Uh, right, well, in the point of view that I'm using, and you may have a more sophisticated point of view in mind, in the point of view that I'm using, um, these numbers are going to tell us the dimensions of the spaces of states, uh, which is about what I'm about to <coughs> begin to explain and, and complete later. So these are just some non-negative integers, um, and I'll stop and just mention that uh, what we're doing here is we're sort of defining a commutative algebra over the integers, so I can, I think of this multiplication as associative and commutative, and so I have this little algebra, and these are the um, uh, structure relations in the algebra. And the algebra is generated by these elements phi alpha. So what the ends tell us is kind of the number of ways in which you can fuse alpha with beta and get gamma. Now you might think, well, they should, they should either be zero or one, but it turns out that you can actually have these numbers be larger than one, and that, and that becomes important. Uh, but in fact, um, well, okay, let me, let me come to that in a second. Uh, so my uh, honorary quasi-particle type, which is the trivial or just local operations, is labeled by zero, that's phi zero, and that's the identity in the ring, so I call it one. So that, in that case, this relation simplifies to the action of the identity element, so my commutative algebra has, the, has an identity element, multiplicative identity. And furthermore, for each alpha, I will assume that there's also a, a, a corresponding antiparticle type, alpha bar, defined by the property that in the fusion rules, which is unique, by the way, alpha bar, in the fusion rules, phi alpha times phi alpha bar always gives me the identity type with coefficient one, and then maybe some other terms. Okay. <coughs> All right, so finally, the statement, which I will uh, explain better with an example later, uh, the statement is that if the sum over gamma of these numbers, n alpha, beta, gamma, is bigger than one, then there will be degenerate states when I start to multiply, um, start to, um, uh, when I construct a state with, with uh, um, some of these quasi-particles, for example, alpha and beta. There's a question about boundary conditions, and when I have more, I can use this iteratively to get some numbers, as we'll see, and, um, and working with this algebra, the use of this little algebra is that it allows us to calculate um, the, uh, the dimensions of the spaces of degenerate states for some given set of quasi-particle types. Okay, was there a question? Stretching? It corresponds to taking the ground state or a state with other quasi-particles and cre to create the quasi-particle type, we can do nothing. Or we could use a local operator. It's c again, it's convenient to have this as part of the structure because otherwise I can't, well, I can't make statements like that and I need it when I'm calculating these multiplicities. I can't just say that's nothing and throw it out. I like to make the analogy with in ancient times when, you know, there was a time when no one knew about the number zero you know, you know what, is, what is zero? That's just nothing, that's not a number. Well, then we realize that actually if you're more sophisticated, zero actually is a number that you have to use in your number system. Okay, so that's why it's here. Even though it's a completely trivial object where you didn't do anything. Yes? Yes. Yes. What does it mean when it's bigger than one? Well, what does it mean even if it's zero or one? I think what I'm gonna do is I'm not gonna explain this anymore now, but I'm gonna have an example later which illustrates how this works in practice and I hope that will make it clearer. Okay, I'm gonna use Majorana zero modes or make contact with it. Um, I won't actually have an example where the ends themselves can be bigger than one. That's a sort of further complication, but it's not very much different. Yeah. because that's part of the definition. I don't, I don't think, um, I think, well, I think there can some consistency conditions prevent it from having coefficient bigger than one. Sort of part of the axioms or something. Yeah. Well, if you kill the arbitrary coefficient, that's just the definition of the kind of meaningless, right? Because then it just reduces to your definition of the meaningless. 
Um, well, there's also this definition for the identity don't forget, <laughs> so it's not just any old quasi-particle. Um, Arbitrary. Yeah, well, it's, it's still it's restricted science. by this, unless you want to drop that as well. So, all right. Um, I'm not sure I remember the, the precise answer to the, to the question why this coefficient is one. I'm not sure exactly what's the best way to answer that. But on the other hand, in practice, and we can look at explicit examples of constructions, and I really like to use examples to really motivate things, even though I'm not <laughs> presenting it that way at the moment, um, it's always one. All right, so later I'll illustrate this, this point a bit more. I just wanted to say something about how the degeneracies or the multiplicities of degeneracy are connected with the uh, fusion rules. Uh, and so the case in which, let me just say, the case in which the sum of the over gamma of these is bigger than one means I have a non-abelian system. And if they're always one, everything is abelian. And in fact, the abelian case you can see is equivalent to an abelian group. So that's fusion. Now I want to talk about quasiparticle statistics. So to define statistics in the most general way that we need here, we should uh, imagine that we drag the quasiparticles around on some paths adiabatically, which means very slowly. So we actually have the physical system in principle. We have some excitations, which we imagine we've some quasiparticles, which we've localized near some places and we change some parameters so that we drag them around and exchange them, um, such that in the end, they come back to the same positions, except that I'm allowed to permute quasi-particles of the same type. It's not very interesting to permute them if they're different types, because I can't really compare the states. But I can compare it <laughs> if I permute them among each quasi-particle type only. So uh, because we come back then to something which is uh, of the same uh, uh, type, we can calculate from using the adiabatic theorem a Berry phase or matrix um, so that the state, the, so the, the final state is some phase or matrix times the original state. So in the case where I have degenerate quasi-particle states, this will generally be a unitary matrix and not just the more familiar Berry phase factor. <laughs> And when we do this, we have to keep the quasi-particles well separated throughout so that the degeneracies are not split and the quasi-particle types are well defined. Okay. Now, <clears throat> so, uh, so the result, this Berry phase, this actually can depend on the path that's taken. So, uh, for example, Nati, I don't know if he's still here, but uh, in Nati's talk, he was talking about how they have some lines and it's topological because you can deform the path. <laughs> um, in the systems that we're talking about here, well, actually, it's not completely true that the result of this adiabatic transport is independent of the path that you use. Um, but one can argue that if I make a small deformation in path, the result, though the result can change, it can only change by a phase factor, even in the case where I have degenerate states. So it doesn't change by some matrix. I get a matrix, but under a change of path, it can only change by a multiplicative phase factor. And furthermore, the phase factor that you get does not depend on which other quasi-particles are present in your system. So in other words, I get something which I can write, the, not just the change, but the, the path-dependent path-dependent factor is an exponential of some, some phase factor. And so when I, when I uh, do the exchange of quasi-particles and I permute them, if I think of initial and final times identified, then the world lines form a bunch of loops, which may be knotted and may link each other. Um, and I have a quasi-particle type running around each loop. And then what I get for the phase is that I get a contribution from each loop which depends on the path and the quasi-particle type, but it does not depend at all on what other quasi-particle types are present in my whole process. Okay? And the reason that 
that it must have this relatively simple form is that if it did depend on the other quasi-particle types that are present on which particular of the de degenerate states I'm in, then under a small change, um, I would get, so a small change in path is basically a local operation. So if this depended on more than just the path, it depended on the states or on which quasi-particles are present, then I could use, that's a local operation, and I could use it to tell me which quasi-particles are present, but I'm not, a, I'm not allowed to do that because it's all topological. Okay. So this is the only form that it can have, but it can still be non-trivial. So really what it means is that these, these um, uh, phases here, or one forms that I'm integrating along these uh, paths in, uh, in space-time, which is periodically, uh, uh, let me see, maybe in space-time with a periodic ad identification of initial and final times. So this is a one form, it's just a function of position. It depends on the background space-time, but it does not depend on what quasi-particles are present. Okay, I hope that's reasonably clear. All right, and so this really shows up in some examples. So now if we now leave that behind, the remaining effects of exchange um, and so those phase factors that I was just mentioning, by the way, are not in any way topological. They can depend on microscopic details and what the background is and so on. Um, so the remaining facts, effects are, they only depend on the is what, what I call the, is the isotopy class of the exchange. That is, um, they're invariant under small deformations of the path by which I exchange things. So for example, here are two paths um, uh, you can see that this configuration can be continuously deformed to this configuration without the lines crossing. So these are isotopic. But on the other hand, this similar configuration cannot be deformed to the trivial one without the paths crossing for topological reasons. Okay. And, th and this, the reason that this comes in is because the quasi-particles must always be well separated at any time. <coughs> And so more schematically, I'll draw a picture like the last one in, in this um, uh, flattened out uh, kind of picture. Uh, yeah, I did that a long time ago. Two space dimensions. Okay, so here the lines are colored. The basic case that I want to look at now is when all the quasi-particles are the same type. Um, okay. So there's a basic operation which is just exchanging neighboring quasi-particles. Here the lines are colored, they're the same type, the lines are just colored so you can see it more easily. So they're the same type so I'm allowed to just exchange them and these are generators for all possible uh, braids that I can make. Everything can be built up out of transpositions like this of nearest neighbors where I have to pay attention to whether the one on the left goes above or below the one on the right. So these are generators for a group and they obey some relations. For example, you can see that because everything is independent, un unchanged under isotopy, that this must be the same as this so that these generators acting on distinct, not just these, but any distinct pairs of, uh, of lines must commute, this is the time direction going upwards, these operations commute, so that's a relation between these operations, and then there's the sometimes called the Yang-Baxter relation, but that's a bit uh, ahistorical really. Um, there's this which allows you to pass um, this red line, for example, through the other intersections there if you do it the right way. So these are also equivalent. And relations like these are the only relations that, are, that you need to completely define the group of all possible braids or exchanges of the quasi-particles. This is Artan's braid group. Okay, and so this um, effect, the, apart from the useless phase factors, the effect of an exchange is, of a basic exchange is uh, tau, is represented by a unitary matrix, possibly a phase, on the space of states, so we have these for all possible nearest, uh, nearest neighbor exchanges, one through n minus one, 
the matrices obey these relations. So then we have a representation on my space of states of this gradient. <coughs> in simple cases, like with Laughlin quasi-particles, the matrices become just scalars, or which are or phase factors. This is the case of anions, or fractional statistics. some hard work solving the Lagrangian. Doing some hard work to solve the Lagrangian. If, you, if your Lagrangian is a microscopic description of the system, it's very difficult to tell what phase it's even in. Right? So, I mean, that, that question contains, in a way, all, a lot of the physics, because the big, a big physical question is, well, you know, I want to know what phase something is in, and um, I, I mean, I may have a precise system in mind. What, what side of some phase boundary does it lie on? That's not an easy question to answer. It's never an easy question. At least in a sort of condensed matter context. You know. Of course, if you have some sort of model system in mind, then this may be much easier to handle. But a realistic system <coughs> can, be, can be extremely hard. Okay, so this is... Um, this is now the idea of non-abelian statistics. It means that our quasi-particles generate a, a space of states with dimension bigger than one, and exchanges of them give me a non-abelian representation of the braid group, non-abelian because usually different exchanges don't commute, except when they're on distinct uh, pairs of quasi-particles. So the consistency of this whole setup some of which I've, I've sketched part of the setup at least here. Uh, this was explored in mathematical works, mathematical physics, Doppler and Roberts, Froelich, in uh, the 80s, late 80s. Um, there are some <laughs> further relations um, that I should mention. So I was talking about all the particles, quasi particles being the same type, but there's, you can have it, uh, effects with two distinct quasi particle types. You can't exchange them with each other, but you can take one around the other. Then you have some mutual statistics. That can be non-trivial. And furthermore, the fusion of quasi-particle types has to be consistent with the exchange or braiding. So in other words, you should get the same result if you fuse alpha and beta to get gamma and then take another quasi-particle delta, the type delta, around. You should get the same result <laughs> as if you took uh, delta around alpha and then around beta and then uh, fuse alpha and beta afterwards. So this gives you some relations involving parts of the data, some of which I have not described explicitly. Um, so this gives you some consistency relations that these have to satisfy. Okay, now here's an amazing thing. So this structure began to appear in, in, in connection with what are the possible statistics of particles and so on. But it also appeared in rational conformal field theory, in the work of Moore and Zyberg in particular. It also appeared, or at least part of it, in connection with representation theory of quantum groups. And these developments uh, culminated in um, what I'm going to call, following the mathematicians, um, a modular tensor <coughs> category and was also connected with quantum Chern-Simons gauge theories by Ed Witten. And this, uh, as he explained, this is also connected with topological invariance of knots and links. And you can, you can easily generate, given a representation of the braid group like I described, you can easily generate uh, an invariant, an isotopy invariant of um, at least some kinds of links simply by closing the diagram from top to bottom and then taking the trace of the product of the tau matrices that you get. And because of the braid group relations, this is an isotopy invariant of this particular link. So that's essentially the idea of the Jones uh, not polynomials um, from uh, earlier and can also be developed to give invariants of three manifolds. Well, you see, the underlying reason is that the physics is local. Everything's really done in local quantum field theory. Even though we've got something, something a bit non-local is going <coughs> on in the states, um, 
which I'll maybe emphasize more uh, again later, but nonetheless, the underlying things are local, and this is why, you know, it doesn't matter if something happens in this, at some time here, um, versus of in another place at a different time, it doesn't matter whether it's earlier or later than this, because they're well separated, let's say. And so, um, and so these things are supposed to not depend on when things happen, because of, because of the underlying locality of interactions in the system. Well, they don't commute at different points. And that's, that's about all I want to say. Now, you, you, people may have different ideas on that, but you, sometimes you have to be a little precise what exactly you mean. Okay. Uh, all right, so that's enough of the generalities. I apologize for this slide. I thought I couldn't do better than this beautiful bit of writing. Um, I only have three that are handwritten. It might at least be easier than some people's blackboard writing. So. Um, and I'm not sure how much of this I want to do, but in principle, the basics of quantum Hall effect are on the slide. We have a two-dimensional electron gas. It's living at the interface between some layers of superconductor. We can push current through and measure the Hall conductivity, which is the voltage across the current path divided, whoops, this one, across the current path divided by the current. That's the Hall res resistance. <laughs> Classically, that will be a straight line. It's a straight line function of magnetic field, B over NEC, where N bar is the particle density. But then it was discovered, in fact, in the quantum system, that there are these steps, and um, which sort of oscillate around the classical line. And taking uh, this result, we can rewrite it by, this is classical, so there's no H bar here, but we can introduce H bar, or H, and, um, and then we have H over E squared there, which is an interesting quantity related to the fine structure constant. And this part B, if I write this the other way up, N bar HC over BE, this is a dimensionless quantity. This is a dimensionless measure of the density of particles. It's density of particles in terms of the area, um, <coughs> the area that contains a single uh, magnetic flux quantum. So then if I invert this resistance or resistivity, I get the Hall conductivity, sigma xy, and that's nu e squared over h. So that's the basic result about Hall conductivity. So this is valid um, when also the, what happens is that the longitudinal resistance is zero on the, in the states on the plateau here. And really uh, here I'm, I'm supposed to invert a matrix um, these are the off-diagonal elements, um, and because the diagonal elements are zero, but the off-diagonal ones aren't, the longitudinal conductivity, sigma xx, is also zero, because I inverted a matrix, not a number. Okay. And so under those conditions, then, this is, uh, this is a number <coughs> times e squared over h, and the remarkable thing is that nu is found to be either an integer or a rational number. Those are the integer quantum Hall effect and the rational, uh, fractional quantum Hall effect. All right. Um, so, enough about experiments. So, um, now, so analyze theoretically, let, we start with a single particle in a magnetic field. We have a single particle Hamiltonian with a vector potential A. We'll use the symmetric gauge and then the, there's the, uh, the energy eigenvalues of those of a simple harmonic oscillator. And I'll just focus on the lowest level. The lowest level is degenerate. There's a set of degenerate states. In, this is in the infinite plane. And those have the form of z, which is x plus i y, to a non-negative integer power times this Gaussian factor and some normalization. And I'm setting the length scale called the magnetic length which is similar to the one I mentioned before. This is h bar c over eb. I'll set that equal to one. And then the wave functions have this form. These are the single particle, these are single particle eigenstates. And they form a basis for this, for the lowest Landau level. So these states, you can easily calculate. These states uh, have a maximum uh, amplitude at mod z is square root of 2m in these same units. And so, so they're on these rings, concentric rings. 
And so the number, you can count the number of states in a unit area is 1 over 2 pi. In other words, we have one state per Landau level, it's the same for the other Landau levels, one state per Landau level per area covered by one flux quantum. Okay, so that's the counting of states. It's the same for higher Landau levels. Um, and so then, if we let's just imagine we have Fermi statistics, now I'll have many particles, here's my lowest Landau level. If I fill it up, put the chemical potential between levels, my density takes a particular value, which corresponds to, in this case, <coughs> nu equals one, um, but I have an energy gap in the spectrum. If I want to create a particle of fermion excitation, or a hole, um, the energy needed for doing one versus the other differs by h bar omega c, so I have an energy gap in the spectrum, in the excitation spectrum. So this is a state with an energy gap. And I'm not going to go into more details about that, but it's because of this energy gap that we get the quantization of the Hall conductivity. And one can directly calculate the Hall conductivity in the setup I've described, because in fact, uh, because of translation invariance, you can very easily calculate this formula quite trivially. Even if nu is a fraction, this is still, this is still valid, although quantization would not hold. It would not be robust under things like translation invariance, breaking perturbations. Okay. Any questions on these very quick slides here? All right. So, okay, so that's from very quick background. And the main thing I want to take away from this is in the blue box. This is what my single particle functions look like. So when I look at many particle wave functions, they have to be built out of these basis states. So now we can talk about trial wave functions. <coughs> so uh, first of all, a many-particle wave, many wave function with all the particles in the lowest lambda level is built out of those functions I just mentioned. So what it means is it's got a Gaussian factor in each variable, and then there's some function of the uh, complex coordinate z, um, and so f is holomorphic in all of the complex coordinates, and uh, if I have boson, if my particles are bosons, this is invariant under permutations, it's symmetric. If I have fermions, it's anti-symmetric. Okay. And we can, we should be able to understand the quantum Hall effect using such wave functions if we imagine that interactions are weak. In the, in the fractional case, we have only partial filling of a Landau level. We have a lot of degenerate states. We're not filling it up, so we have a lot of degenerate states. Um, so if interactions are weak, we can, we're just working in a degenerate space, um, and we should be able to then ignore excitations to higher Landau levels. Okay. So in that framework then, Laughlin proposed a trial wave function for the uh, observed <laughs> one-third fractional quantum Hall state, and that has this product form. It's a Gaussian, and then we have this product form of zi minus zj to the power q. q is a positive integer, and initially we were thinking about electrons, which are fermions, so we need q to be odd. It works just as well for bosons. Okay, so this is the function. Um, uh, so the, what's good about this function? Well, this you may imagine that this has a low interaction energy. It may be the ground state for repulsive interactions because it vanishes rather rapidly when zi approaches zj. So the particles avoid each other, and so if I take the expectation of the interaction, this seems like a rather good low energy state. So now I want to show that the filling factor in this state is uh, 1 over q. So first we can observe that the highest power of any zi or zj in this state by looking at this product function here, we see the highest power is Q times N minus one, okay? So because here I can get one ZJ for each of the other remaining particles to the power Q. So I get Q times N minus one, and I'll call that N <laughs> phi. That's the number of flux. Remember that this M is related to how far from the origin that particle is. 
in the angular momentum basis. So the one that's furthest out is at M max, so I can say that the number of magnetic flux quanta enclosed in the system covered by the, the area covered by the particles is, um, I'll call that N phi, is Q times N minus one. So if the particle density is uniform inside that radius, uh, the <laughs> radius square root of two M max, then it implies that the filling factor, which in the units I'm using with magnetic length equals one is just two pi times the density. This is the number of particles over the number of flux alternatively, and then take the limit, and I get one over Q. So the filling factor is one over Q, but I had to assume that the particle density is actually uniform. Okay, everyone's still with me? Next slide. So here's how Laughlin argued that indeed the density is uniform, at least under uh, the interesting conditions. <laughs> so, um, so there's a plasma mapping, often called a plasma analogy. Let's take the mod square of the wave function. It's, this is, of course, real. This is the exponential. I can write it as the exponential of Q times sum over I less than J log of the mod square of the distance between particles. And plus I have this quadratic term and I've multiplied and divided by Q. So what is this? This is the Boltzmann weight for a two-dimensional plasma of charges. Okay, in two dimensions, the Coulomb interaction is a logarithm. That's what I have here. So these are repulsively interacting <coughs> charges and there's a uniform background charge of one over two pi Q. If I want to think of it, uh, that way I'll take this factor of Q out, call this factor of Q one over temperature. So then the background charge is one over Q and my particles have charge one. So this uh, mod Z squared corresponds to the potential correspond produced by uniform background charge. Okay, so this is a plasma. Um, if I want to calculate the partition function of this, I have to integrate this whole thing over all the particle coordinates. And this plasma is in a screening phase if Q is not too large, less than about 70. So what that means is that the density of particles anywhere in the, inside, the, inside the boundary of the, the, the edge of my drop, <laughs> it will still form a drop, a, a, a disc-shaped shaped drop. The density inside the drop must be locally the same as the background density. So if I just take the expectation of the density, in the statistical average defined by this uh, Boltzmann weight, normalized by the partition function, of course. Um, that density must be such as to calculate, uh, cancel the background charge density. So at least if we take an average over some distance, which is bigger than some screening length, which is actually something like the particle spacing, the density really is uniform. The expectation of density is just a constant. And so this is, this, is really, this is really true for Q less than 70. Okay. And furthermore, you say, that although this is sort of a classical argument, um, this mod square of the wave function is all I need to calculate the quantum mechanical expectation of density. So the quantum mechanical expectation of density is just behaving in the way I said. And we can even consider <coughs> correlations of density and we can, in principle, they're described by the same plasma. Okay, for Q is one, you can actually also see this directly. The wave function is a van der Mond determinant times the Gaussian, and that just means we're filling up all the states in the lowest lambda level out to M max. Um, it's that van der Mond determinant that showed up in the measure for random matrices yesterday. Um, and um, well, okay. And one more point, uh, there's a, uh, there's a, what I call a special interaction Hamiltonian. There's a Hamiltonian for particles in the lowest lambda level. Uh, it's an interaction term, um, and it's a term for which the Laughlin state is an exact zero energy eigenstate. And furthermore, it's the densest such eigenstate. So you pack the particles as closely together as you can, keeping zero energy, you get precisely the Laughlin state, up to translations of the center of mass. So this is also sometimes very useful in the analysis. 
Okay. Now we can look at fractionally charged excitations. This is what um, made this very exciting. So uh, Laughlin proposed that we can make a state with a quasi-hole, or what I'll call a quasi-hole, by multiplying into the Laughlin wave function a product zj minus w. We've got an additional complex coordinate w, I multiply this factor in, this is still a polynomial in the z's times a Gaussian, so it's still a lowest lambda level wave function. But now the particles, the, you see the wave function vanishes if any particle e coordinate equals w. So the particles avoid w. I've made a little hole in the density, in the density profile of the... <coughs> if I do the same trick, I take the mod square, then I get another plasma which now has, if you like, an impurity fixed at w. I don't integrate over this coordinate, of course, but I've got an impurity in my plasma, and because there's no exponent q up here, this has charge 1 over q compared with the particles. So again, there's perfect screening if q is less than 70, and so there's a net deficiency in particle number there, which uh, just so is so the total charge locally in the plasma is still... Um, the net charge, is t charge density is zero on average. So there must be a missing particle number of, <laughs> of one over Q in the vicinity of W. And so it's localized within a distance, which is again this screening length. So this means that this object has a fractional charge in, I have to make two caveats here. One is, when I say it has fractional charge, I mean I'm looking at the density profile and integrating it after subtracting off the background density that I have in the ground state itself. Otherwise, I just get infinity when I integrate out to infinity. And the second thing is, that's sort of a local thing to do, to calculate that integral and not go too far. You may say, well, the particle number in the system is still n, so how can I have a fractional charge? Well, the point is that by putting the quasi-hole in, I've pushed all the particles out a little bit, and the remaining, the missing particle number the particle number that's missing at W is found on the boundary of the system, which has been slightly enlarged. Okay. Uh, okay, so then we can generalize this. You can multiply by more factors with different coordinates W to make more quasi-holes. You can also construct so-called quasi-electrons in which instead of removing or pushing charge density out, you suck it inwards so that you have some ex additional charge, um, not a negative charge like these, but a positive charge. Those are called quasi-electrons. But in this case, there's no, unlike the quasi-hole case, there's no such unique, nice way to write down a trial <coughs> function for that. They exist, but they're not all that nice or unique. Whereas this one is just very, very nice, natural kind of function. Okay. All right, so these objects are quasi-particles in the sense that I was describing earlier. You can't make this by acting on the Laughlin states, even if I use a fermion operator and destroy a particle, or if I use a density operator. Uh, in fact, if I do remove a particle by using a, a destruction operator, um, I just replace one of the coordinates, zi, by by W, but then I get exponent Q. So Q quasi-holes at one place is equivalent to destroying a real particle. <coughs> so that's a real hole. Uh, now a real hole, to the you know, depending what I want to say about fermions, but in particular I could just talk about bosons, a real hole I may want to think of as a local object. It's created by applying a local operator, the destruction operator. So that's equivalent to doing nothing, from my point of view. You see, that real hole is the, is the identity type, the trivial type. But that's Q quasi-holes. That means there's only Q distinct types of quasi-particles, including the trivial one, where I do nothing. So they're labeled by 0, 1, 2, 3, up to Q. So someone asked yesterday if I was going to explain that, um, that it's modulo Q that we count charges, and here's where that's explained. Okay, uh, so if we again imagine these as um, trial wave functions for 
some interaction Hamiltonian, or even use the special interaction Hamiltonian, then these quasi holes, or at least the quasi electrons, <laughs> um, cost some energy to create. So the energy, there's an energy gap in the system. If I want to create a quasi electron and a quasi hole, it's at least very plausible that this takes a non zero amount of energy, although it's an amount, an amount of energy that remains finite even when I drag these objects far apart, so they're not confined. Okay, so, uh, well, so I, I phrased that uh, in that way because this is not perhaps proved even for the Laughlin state. It's not a rigorous proof of that, but <laughs> numerically there's very good evidence that that's true and so on. So that means the fact that there's that gap means that we really do have a topological phase of matter um, we have fractionally charged quasi-particles, and because we have this gap, we can put forward additional arguments to say that this is the fractional quantum Hall effect. Yeah? Um, I leave it as an exercise. <laughs> you, you can try d by dz. You can look up Laughlin's paper. That's what, he, that's what he said, but you can also use many other things and none of them really look any nicer than any other. Well, they're not precisely the same function, but um, we would like to imagine that they represent the same type of quasi-particle. Yeah. For what states? Oh, okay, I think I understand what you're asking. So, oops. Um, so these quasi-hole states are again zero energy exact eigenstates for the, <coughs> for the Haldane uh, pseudo-potential Hamiltonian. The quasi-electrons are not, they will have non-zero energy, but you can't, you can't say they're eigenstates. That's another reason why there's no nice way to write one down. So another way to say that this is unique is that this is exactly the, the thing which is a zero energy eigenfunction of the Haldane uh, interaction term, which by the way is a positive operator, so all the energies must be either zero or positive. Well, that's a more heuristic argument, so let, I don't really want to spend more time on that. It's a more heuristic argument, it's not proved rigorously, but it's believed based on many things. Okay? What? Okay. All right, so, um, so those are Laughlin's functions. There were some other trial functions, but now I want to turn to the conformal field theory ideas in my last 15 minutes or so. Um, all right, so the idea, which is, sounds extremely weird if you come from solid state physics and you started working on fractional quantum Hall effect, so, or anything, any other solid state physics for that point of, for that matter. So we're going to make trial wave functions for the system in two plus one dimensions by using a conformal field theory in two dimensions, okay, or the Euclidean version of one plus one dimensions. The theory that we're going to use is a single scalar field, or something with a U1 symmetry, uh, plus another one, some other field theory. So what I'm going to write is, uh, well, I've got an operator I'll call O, and I've got a product of some operators that are sort of local fields that depend on the coordinates zi. And A of z, is uh, this exponential of i times the scalar field phi times a coefficient, one over a square root of nu. And I remind you that Robert Digraph talked about these operators yesterday in this scalar field CFT, so we, we know how to calculate correlators of these operators. This is chiral, it only depends on z. So phi is defined really by, in a slightly unrigorous way perhaps, by uh, this two-point function which is a logarithm, 
and this is a free field, so using Wick's theorem, you can, you can expand the exponent, exponential and calculate these term by term and sum them all up. And then we have another field, Psi, which is some other field taken from some other CFT, which could be many different things. I don't want to specify it at the moment. So that means that we have a rather general kind of construction here, which will give us some functions. So this is going to give some functions of Z, and, um, and the operator O is an exponential of a coefficient times an integral of phi over Z. This is something which is going to give us the, um, really the background magnetic field. It's going to give us that Gaussian factor in the wave functions. This represents a background density. So these um, are often called charged operators, and then this integral term is, the, is a background charge density. Um, okay, so there's something about uh, psi should have abelian fusion rules and actually be, it should be a simple current. I think I come back to that. It could, just, it could just be the identity operator. In other words, you could just drop psi. Suppose we do that and we just look at the first part. The first part is always present in all of these things, so we should look at that. So when we do this calculation, we use Wick's theorem. We incidentally, we have to normal order the exponential of I phi here to do this. Um, we use some standard tricks, which have been known for a long time, but there's a few things you have to know to do it, really. But anyway, the result is that you get just these uh, factors, zi minus zj. Uh, that should say product over i less than j, not just product i with I 1 to n. So you get, these, you get the Laughlin factor here, and the interaction of e to the i phi with the background density, which I'll imagine is also in some sense normal ordered, gives me the um, gives me the Gaussian factors. Actually, I, sh I shouldn't really say this is just, this is normal ordered. I should say, well, really there are interactions between each little bit of points of uh, small element of charge density in the background. They interact with each other. And um, that doesn't depend on the coordinate zj, so that I, can, I can drop that. However, those effects um, eventually are, are important enough that we would want to include them in some later analysis probably in the next lecture or the one after. Okay, so it's not too difficult without the psi to convince yourself that calculating this uh, actually gives these functions. Okay. Actually, it gives this up to a singular gauge transformation, which is because there's, a, there's always a phase like there is here. This is a complex factor, whereas this is purely real. And really, the interaction of each of these A's with the background also gives me some kind of phase factors which are um, very singular, so I'm just going to gauge transform those away and get rid of them. Okay, so this is what we have, and so now we see that I need to put nu equals one over q, then this just becomes <coughs> a polynomial in the z's, and it's a valid lowest lambda level wave function. And incidentally, if I put nu equals one, uh, this field theory, e to the i phi times 1, represents the free chiral Dirac fermion. It's just a bosonized version of the fermion. So again, it's very close to the free fermion point of view, and that's the integer quantum Hall effect. Okay. So we can also get the quasi Hall states easily in the same way. We introduce an additional, or more than one additional term, primary field, into the correlator, we can write e to the i q quasi whole phi over square root nu. That's um, in the phi theory. And we can also introduce another field in the psi theory, say sigma, multiply those together, and we can put those in. Um, okay. And the thing is that we will have to choose these somewhat carefully because when we work out the wave function, it still has to be single valued in the coordinate zj because that's just a lowest Landau level function for the particles. It has to be single valued. So that means that I'm not free to do whatever I want with these quasi whole factors here. So when we do this in the simple case with no psi, we also have no sigma. I put Q quasi whole equals one over Q and I get the quasi whole function. So again, I have a nice construction of this function. <laughs> so to come back to quasi electrons, Again, it turns out if you want to do the quasi-electron this way, well, what you would want would be the opposite sign in the exponent here. But when you do that, 
there's no way to avoid the fact that you're going to get a function that blows up when z equals w. And so you get something ugly. You can't do anything about it. So we don't get, ni again, we don't get nice ways to write uh, wave functions for quasi-electrons. We only get them for quasi-holes. But that will be plenty of things to work with to understand the physics of the theory. Okay. <clears throat> Um, might as well say a word about simple currents. This is a little more technical. I don't always need this. Um, maybe for the experts. So I need psi to be a really a simple current. So it has abelian fusion rules. That means if I say psi is equal to psi 1, for example, psi 1 times psi 1 is another field psi 2, and there's nothing else in the fusion rules. And if I continue to iterate the fusion, I just get some more, f I get more fields, but whatever I'm doing, there's um, only one field on the right-hand side up to descendants. And furthermore, when I'm looking at these primary fields sigma, psi 1 times sigma is something which is kind of in the same representation as sigma, and there's only one term. So this uh, is a slightly hand-wavy definition of what I, what's meant by a simple current in conformal field theory. And the precise definition for what we can use in the construction is that psi has to be a simple current. And that's maybe more for the experts than anyone else. Um, okay. And then when it is a simple current, you see these are the conditions that ensure <coughs> that by suitable choices of Q quasi-hole and nu, that we do in fact obtain only polynomial functions of the ZJs because otherwise they wouldn't be good functions. Okay. I don't quite understand why the polynomials. It's because Q is big enough? Uh, mm. Capital Q. Um, well, if you don't have these conditions, all hell can break loose once so, you start. So psi times psi has a singularity, but in your wave function right. on the previous page, yes. you had a Gaussian factor that gave zero to the overall wave that's, function. That's right. So these. These guys have singularities, as we'll see when I do an example in more detail in a second. These have singularities, but that can be cancelled by the, the positive powers here. This is the whole point. And it's only, <laughs> yeah. Yes, and if I have simple currents, then I can always arrange to cancel the singularities. Um, and, um, and I always, and the whole thing is consistent, all of the things, and it obeys the fusion rules and everything works very nicely. Okay. Okay. All right. So even after all those conditions have been put on, sigma can still have non-abelian fusion rules. There are fusion rules in the conformal field theory, just like I was actually describing them for topological theories. But as we've heard, they exist in the in conformal field theory as well. And so my quasi-particle excitations can, in fact, have non-abelian statistics. <coughs> And my goal, which I'm obviously not going to get to in this lecture, is to show you how this non-abelian statistics for the topological theory is actually the same as the statistics in the conformal, conformal theory. The conformal theory, um, so, the, so what I get from the construction is I've really constructed another CFT out of these two component parts, phi and psi. So to describe that, what I should say is that the field A of Z generates a chiral algebra, uh, probably together with, if I take the adjoint or conjugate field, which is, has a minus in the exponent here, so it has the opposite charge, and um, psi, I, have, I need to use the uh, <coughs> conjugate field for psi. So in terms of CFT, I can, I can use these fields in a conformal field theory point of view, and A of Z together with its conjugate generates the chiral algebra. The chiral algebra contains the U1 current, which is minus I d phi, and also the stress tensor T of the chiral conformal field theory. I think Robert mentioned many of these things, including the chiral algebra. Okay. In simple cases, the chiral algebra, like for Laughlin, the chiral algebra is basically just the U1 current algebra. Um, and when I do the Ising theory, the stress tensor is uh, associated with the Ising theory. So the, actually, the stress tensor I mean here is the total one consisting of the stress tensor for phi, 
plus the stress tensor for psi, whatever that theory is. <laughs> and then this uh, chiral algebra has, in, at least in some sense, a finite set of primary fields. And one of those primary fields is the quasi-hole field that I constructed called tau, which may, be, may have non-abelian properties. So then this construction viewed in conformal field theory gives us a conformal field theory that may be rational. It's not always rational. And the construction of the wave functions may give us a topological phase, and this can have quasi-particles with non-abelian statistics. However, none of these things actually holds in every single case. Um, and furthermore, in, in many cases, there's also a special Hamiltonian or parent Hamiltonian, which is like the Laughlin uh, special, Ham uh, sorry, Haldane special Hamiltonian. It's a Hamiltonian such that the trial ground state and quasi-hole states are zero energy eigenstates. But again, in general, we can't really prove that there's a gap in the bulk spectrum. And in fact, in certain cases, we expect that there is not a gap in the bulk spectrum, even within this construction. And uh, eventually, I will indicate why I claim that's the case, and that should be the case when the conformal field theory, and it should be a the case at least when the conformal field theory, in the cases where it's not unitary or not rational. <laughs> in particular, the, the psi part of the theory might not be a rational theory. Yes? The conformal field theory is the one you started with when writing the correlation problems. Uh, well, I'm sort of taking the point of view that I, that in some sense I, I took two CFTs and I combined them, making some selection of which bits go with which bits to get another CFT. Uh, the two were the abelian part was phi yes. and some other CFT. And something else. And sometimes the phi part is called the charge sector because all the U1 charge is associated with that part. And the other part, we have to call it something. We may call it the statistics sector because that's where the interesting statistics comes from. Okay, so this is looking like this may be a good place to stop. Uh, I think it would be very pedagogical if I take an extra couple of minutes and talk about the example. So this is our, our, our basic example from our paper. First, I'll, I'm writing the wave function. Here's a nice wave function. We'll just write it down. So we have a Laughlin factor with exponent Q. And then I have another part which is actually a Fafian. It's a product of 1 over z1 minus z2, 1 over z3 minus z4, and so on. And then I anti-symmetrize this. In other words, I add, all, uh, add or subtract all of these cyclic permutations that make the whole thing anti-symmetric. And that's the definition of a Fafian. You can define a Fafian for any anti-symmetric matrix. It's very standard. Um, here I would say that I, I want to put the diagonal entries to be zero so to avoid problems. Anyway, so that's the Fafian. Another way you can think of a Fafian um, of uh, some functions of particle coordinates, or this particular one, is that it's a kind of BCS state. So a BCS state written in real space rather than K space gives you, well, depending whether you have spin or not, if you don't have spin, it's a Fafian of some function of particle coordinates. If, it's, um, if you have spin, like in BC, uh, the original BCS S wave, it's a determinant. I think it was Freeman Dyson who pointed out that, that the real space wave function is a determinant, actually. Okay, so this uh, particular case, by symmetry, we can call this a P minus IP state for spinless fermions. My electrons have no, or particles, have no um, internal or SU2 spin here. A lot of people talk about P plus IP, but usually I call this P minus IP because actually this has angular momentum minus one and not plus one. Okay, and the filling factor here, well, what happens with these kind of examples, this is an example of the construction as we'll see, is that this part here, there aren't very many factors of Z here. For any particular ZJ, it doesn't appear many times. And so the filling factor is just determined by the exponent in the Laughlin factor here. So the filling factor is just one over Q. Um, now Q needs to be even, in this case, even if I have fermions and odd if I have bosons. And that's because the Fafian is anti-symmetric. So if I have <laughs> bosons, I need to make it symmetric by having an odd exponent here. And similarly for fermions. Okay, 
Uh, so that's interesting because it means that for fermions, for electrons, this can occur at one half. It violates the odd denominator rule of early fractional quantum Hall effect in that there's, a, there's, an, there's an even denominator. And by adding, by thinking of this as done in, a, in the second Landau level and filling the lowest Landau level with particles of both spin, this then maps onto a state for filling factor five halves, which is actually observed, a fraction that's observed experimentally and is very likely described by um, this phase of matter or at least by its particle hole conjugate. Okay. So let's now understand that using the conformal field theory construction. So what we do is we take psi to be a free chiral Majorana field in two dimensions. So this is a free field. Its two-point function is just one over z. It's free, so again, you can use Wick's theorem. Putting psi into the general formula that I had, you just have to calculate the correlator of n of the psi's with n even, and because of this, you get, and because of the Fermi statistics, you get exactly the Fafi amount that I wrote down. Okay. Now this uh, Majorana conformal field theory is the conformal field theory of the Ising model critical point. Or well, it's the chiral part of the conformal field theory anyway. And the Ising model, of course, has the spin variable, the original Ising spin, when we split by holomorphic factorization, which Robert mentioned, the spin into uh, chiral and antichiral parts, we arrive at this spin field, sigma, and the operator product of psi and sigma has, <coughs> is one over z to the one half times sigma of zero. So what that means is that a psi in a correlation function, a psi going around a sigma, we come back with the opposite sign. And so this is rather like a vortex in a superfluid. In fact, that's the interpretation of, of this that I like. Uh, it's like a pi flux vortex in the, in the BCS paired state. Um, and so you, then you can even calculate explicitly with this, and the wave function for two quasi-holes contains a modified Fafian, which has this precise structure. And then, of course, we have the uh, Laughlin factor, and we have some fractional charge factors for the <coughs> quasi-holes, which I see I've forgotten to mention the fractional charge here. So in this case, the fractional charge of the quasi-hole object that I make is one over two Q, not one over Q. And it's fractionalized further because of this square root that appears here. Okay, and so again, the charge of this, of the quasi-hole is determined because I have to cancel this square root singularity with something in the charge sector to get a polynomial function of the particle coordinates. Um, okay. And so since these, um, these are like pi vortices, they tend to come in pairs, at least given some <coughs> fixed boundary conditions, um, just like they do in superconductors. So I realize my example goes on a bit. I don't want to do too much now. So um, I think perhaps I'll stop here and take any further questions. Yes. Was the CFT that you started with to obtain the ground state wave function, was that an educated guess, or did you somehow well, construct it using it? Uh, I mean, it wasn't like we were trying to solve a particular problem in doing so. We were just trying to do constructions. Well, there was something we wanted. We wanted to get non-abelian statistics. So we wanted, and we made up, in fact, you can see in, the, in our old paper that we have some other examples, but this is the one we really like. There's one other thing we, that we implicitly really liked about this example, which we didn't emphasize in the paper, which is that this, this Ising or Majorana CFT is the unique uh, unitary CFT with lowest central charge. And then making it unitary seemed like a good idea. So we did. And it turns out that was a good idea, as we'll, as we'll see. But I, I also mentioned that, you know, we can make lots of other things and um, some of which are quite useful as well. Um, any other questions? Um, 
to some extent, yes. In the Laughlin case, the quasi-hole is a simultaneous zero of, all the, of, of the wave function in all the particle coordinates. In other cases, it's not quite so simple. But again, in the trial states, um, in some cases, there are similar statements as that. Um, and uh, in some nice examples <coughs> that I have, this uh, can actually be connected with nice things in, uh, in uh, West Umino Witten theory and integrable representations and nice stuff like that. Um. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah. So, um, so the chiral CFT you might be thinking about would be m perhaps something that could occur on an edge. That's in one plus one dimensions. But of course, my point of view is not one plus one. It's two Euclidean dimensions. And um, okay. But of course, there's more to the question than that. So you could say, well, it's um, I've got a gapless CFT. I, I should have things that are conformal. What does this have to do with gap states? And, um, and I think more about that will emerge as I, as I get, to get to the end of this set of slides. Um, the point is that what I'm really constructing is a perturbation of, a, of the, of, I, I, I said there's a CFT that I've constructed, but my wave functions are really a perturbation of the CFT, and it ends up being massive. And that's why things are topological, in fact. So um, the sad truth is that we cannot con use this construction for every fractional quantum Hall effect uh, uh, state that seems to exist. We can do some states, but we don't get every state. We could resort to the use of some other constructions to arrive at other filling factors, as is done in the ordinary abelian stuff, the hierarchy theory, and so on. But um, this kind of construction on its own does not give every state. But it does give a lot of good, interesting examples. Uh, so we'll have a chance to ask Nick and other speakers further questions later at 4.30 when we reconvene for the discussion period. In the meantime, let's thank Nick again.